If murders are remembered outside the victims, friends and families, it's usually for their brutality and sometimes because catching the perpetrators takes time. But a daytime street killing by ordinary thugs in Sydney stands out mainly because of its long-term impact on the lives of millions. The senseless slaying of world-famous heart transplant surgeon Dr Victor Chang was nothing short of a major tragedy for Australia. But out of that deep well of sadness, there grew a determination that his pioneering work would continue, advancing mankind's medical knowledge, as well as giving precious hope to heart disease victims across the globe. In the late 1980s, Asian crime gangs are establishing a foothold in Australia's major cities. A special police task force is set up to target them as well as win the confidence of the local community by breaking down the culture of fear and intimidation. But within months of the task force being established, the dumb brutality of the Asian gangs is made all too apparent when Dr Chang is gunned down. The year is 1991. The notoriously brutal Asia-based criminal networks, known as the Triads, are spreading terror throughout Australia's Asian communities. The Triads show no mercy. Their stock in trade is extortion, robbery, torture and murder. Police, up against the secretive nature of some Asian cultures, are making little headway. New South Wales Detective Inspector Jim Council is assigned to target the gangs. They have very scant uh, regard for the law and uh, because of their uh, perhaps uh, or uh, their attitude towards law enforcement and perhaps the lack of uh, our knowledge at that time by the New South Wales Police, uh, they were able to be a little more successful than perhaps they are today. On the 8th of March of that year, uh, we formed uh, Task Force Oak. Now that was to investigate uh, organised Asian crime, such as uh, uh, intimidation, prostitution, extortion. Detective Sergeant Ron Smith is a senior member of the Task Force Team Oak. And the idea was to form closer liaisons with the Asian community and uh, get their trust, the community's trust, and to uh, carry out uh, in-depth investigations into this uh, whole uh, aspect of uh, crime within uh, New South Wales. But it wasn't confined to Sydney, it was also Melbourne. Melbourne had their own Asian task force down there, and uh, so did other states were uh, raising concerns so far as uh, that type of crime was concerned. Sydney's St Vincent's Hospital is a world leader in cardiothoracic surgery, including life-saving heart transplants. Hundreds of patients receive groundbreaking treatment from Dr Chang and his team. Born in Shanghai, China, Victor Chang makes up his mind to be a doctor after his beloved mother dies of cancer when he's just 12. At 15, Victor is sent to the Christian Brothers School at Lewisham in the inner western suburbs of Sydney. He's a gifted student. He goes on to the University of New South Wales and graduates as a Bachelor of Surgery. In 1972, he joins the cardiac unit at St Vincent's Hospital, where he refines the art of heart surgery and works tirelessly to develop artificial heart valves and other life-saving technology. Patients find his cheerful, no-nonsense manner encouraging. They call him by his first name and think of him as a friend. He is also a great ambassador for Australia. He travels extensively throughout Southeast Asia and China, sharing his knowledge with medical professionals in the region. In 1984, the doctor establishes the first National Heart Transplant Unit at St Vincent's. And later that year, he takes on a case that will make him famous in Australia and catapult him into the international spotlight. A 14-year-old schoolgirl, Fiona Coote, is gravely ill with heart disease. Fiona is close to death as Chang and the St Vincent's transplant team go to work. The operation is a complete success. 
Fiona Coote's life is saved and Dr Chang becomes a worldwide hero. Over the next few years, people from all walks of life benefit from the pioneering surgeon's skill and dedication. By 1991, his National Heart Transplant Unit is responsible for almost 200 heart transplants and 14 heart-lung transplants. Dr Chang buys a house in the beautiful beachside suburb of Klontarf. He's a creature of habit. He leaves home to go to work at the same time each morning and he always follows the same route. On the morning of July the 4th, 1991, he gets into his car at the usual time and drives across the picturesque Spit Bridge. Traffic is heavy, but is flowing smoothly as he wends his way up the steep hill that will take him through Mossman. He calls his wife from his car phone as he turns from Spit Road into Military Road, heading towards his city office. Unbeknown to Dr Chang, he is being stalked by two men in a Toyota sedan. As he drives along Military Road in the right lane, he feels a bump and hears the sound of crashing metal as his car is struck on the front left-hand side by another vehicle. He turns into the next side street, Lang Road, and parks his car. The two men in the other vehicle follow him into Lang Road and approach him. A long argument ensues, and the men argue for several minutes. A passerby then hears Dr Chang shout out in English, call the police, they have guns. A shot rings out, and Dr Chang falls to the ground. Then, another. Victor Chang, the king of hearts, the miracle worker, is dead. Australia is horrified by the murder of Dr Victor Chang. Grief is mixed with disbelief and outrage that such a great man could be so cruelly and senselessly cut down. Former New South Wales Premier Neville Rann, a close friend of Victor's, is devastated by news of his murder. I'm oh, more than devastated. I was absolutely thunderstruck. I could not believe that a genius of his quality could be struck down by a couple of gangsters in the streets of Sydney. It uh, lived with me for more than months, for years afterwards. Detective Sergeant Dennis O'Toole, who's played a key role in solving the so-called granny murders just months earlier, is called to the crime scene. I don't think I was prepared for uh, the actual scene when I got there, and uh, I suppose it's something that it shocked most people with uh, Dr Chang. He was such a prominent, well-known person in the community. Um, even people that didn't know him personally, I think, uh, were just outraged and shocked uh, that something like this could happen to uh, such a high-profile person. The assistance of the scientific was sought, of course, and uh, they're, they're always... Uh, have priority as far as uh, investigating the initial stages of a crime scene. And uh, we uh, began to collect uh, evidence and uh, interview witnesses. There were a number of witnesses. In fact, that there was a, a gentleman walking to work past the scene at the time of the shooting, and he had been threatened by the, offend the offender with the firearm. When the murderer points his gun at him, the passerby puts his hands in the air and shouts, it's got nothing to do with me, and flees to safety. It's a miracle that he escapes with his life. He and other witnesses describe Dr Chang's assailants as being of Asian appearance. Detective Sergeant Ron Smith of Task Force Oak is monitoring police radio as a normal part of his duties. 
I spoke with Jim uh, Council and uh, as a result of that I led a team of uh, investigators to uh, Mossman, to the location uh, where um, we found that uh, Dr Victor Chang had in fact been uh, shot dead uh, during an incident there at uh, Mossman and uh, uh, an aborted uh, robbery attempt. Um, by two uh, Asian males, the persons described as being Asian males, who had uh, subsequently fled the scene. Almost immediately, a vital clue is discovered. The crime scene had been left intact, and uh, one of the objects that were located, or was located at the crime scene, uh, was a wallet. And that wallet contained uh, airline tickets, and a, an identification certificate, a Malaysian identification certificate, which uh, I believe is about 20 years old at that stage. However, it certainly did identify a person. Uh, that wallet was something that uh, caused quite a bit of um, concern, as it were, uh, bearing in mind that uh, it's not often that you get th that type of evidence left at a crime scene. And we were faced with the, a number of scenarios, the possibility of it being a setup, uh, the possibility of a red herring, and of course the possibility that it was genuine and that person was involved somehow uh, in this matter. Detective Inspector Mike Hagen is a senior investigator based at Chatswood Police Station. The finding of the wallet as a, as a piece of, of uh, forensic evidence at, at a crime scene was, was most outstanding. Uh, from this point of view that, that it's quite unique that a person who commits a crime would actually drop or, or leave their wallet at a crime scene, but it happened in this case. The murder falls within the jurisdiction of the Regional Crime Squad North, based in Chatswood. But because the victim was of Asian background and because our initial evidence from eyewitness were that the two offenders were of similar Asian appearance, at that stage, Task Force Oak was well established and uh, had been very highly successful in a lot of Asian crime investigation. A decision was made, and it was a very good decision, was made to combine Task Force Oak with the Region Crime Squad at Chatsward, Chatsward to make a combined force of investigators. And at the end of the day, that proved out to be worthwhile. Within hours, the news of Dr Chang's murder gets out and the men of Task Force Oak are facing a media frenzy that's threatening to run out of control. Dennis O'Toole has been assigned to the task force. There were some outlandish allegations made in the press where Dr Chang was involved in the illegal uh, taking of body parts, that he was tied up with the triads that he was part of the movement in China that was going for democracy against the Chinese government and the Chinese government had planned to kill him. There were all these crazy schemes that the media, where they came from, uh, we don't know to this day, but all these theories were put forward and of course a lot of that still has to be acted on and you have to act on that information wherever it did come from. Uh, I won't say it was, wasn't without its uh, hiccups here and there, but certainly uh, there was uh, certain rules that were established with the media and, uh, and in the main it was a fairly amicable relationship during the investigation, but it was certainly a lot of pressure on the investigators at all times so far as the media was concerned. Dr Chang's funeral is held on a grey, sombre day. Ordinary Sydney siders, even though they've never met him, arrive to pay their respects, feeling a profound sense of grief and loss. The, the funeral of Dr Chang was held at uh, St Mary's Cathedral. It uh, was a very dismal day. It was a very bleak day. It was raining. A terrible tragedy that uh, something that I think the people of Sydney showed their respect and their feelings for Dr Chang with the number of people that turned out for him at that funeral. But mixed with the public grief is a burning desire for justice to be done. Task Force Oak has a monumental job to track down the killers and the wallet found at the scene of the crime will produce vital clues. So we um, systematically went through the wallet. Um, we uh, scientifically examined all the pieces of paper. 
Uh, it was all forensically examined, we photocopied it and from that we started commencing inquiries on all the addresses. And in that wallet there was numerous names, numerous telephone numbers, numerous addresses of contacts in Melbourne, all relating to Melbourne. When the owner of the wallet is identified, it seems incredible that he has ever been allowed to enter Australia. The person of interest in Melbourne uh, was identified uh, initially by the police in Melbourne as being a, a person who did have a criminal record, not in this country, but had recently arrived from Malaysia. He had been here earlier in Australia, but had only recently, uh, some weeks earlier, arrived in Australia. The suspect under surveillance is Chu Sang Lu, a 48-year-old Malaysian national. He's traced to a location in Sunbury, on the outskirts of Melbourne. Once it was established uh, that uh, they had uh, Lu under surveillance down there, uh, I travelled with uh, Paul Tuxford to Melbourne and uh, later joined, was later joined by uh, Detective Inspector Mike Hagan and we linked up with the Melbourne uh, uh, team, the homicide squad down there. Our big fear, obviously, with, with Lou was that if we'd approached him too early, his answer or his defence might have been, oh, well, I lost my wallet in Sydney. Thanks, for, thanks very much for finding my wallet. Where did you find it? I lost it in Melbourne. Oh, you found it in Sydney. And that would have been his stock answer, we believe, which would have left us fishing. Um, and so we were very, very careful not to approach him until we had sufficient evidence. To, uh, to interview him and subsequently charge him. Lou is seen by the police surveillance teams in meetings with a number of people, but one particular meeting is of special interest to investigators. It is a meeting between Lou and an as yet unidentified man. Well, there was a meeting in particular where they met in Melbourne, from recollection was on a bus seat or a railway station, and. Uh, the uh, surveillance team said that they were in very uh, deep and uh, uh, conversation and in fact uh, uh, Lou had uh, displayed some sort of alarm at the, in his expressions and during the conversations. It was obviously not just a meeting about a, having a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a beer. It was, uh, it was apparent that they were in, it was a fairly serious sort of conversation. So. With Dennis O'Toole's team assigned the task of identifying the second suspect, Ron Smith, and Mike Hagan prepare to move in on Chu Sang Lu. On the 13th of uh, July, uh, Lu was seen to be dropped in a vehicle at a, uh, a travel agency in, uh, in Melbourne. And uh, then sub subsequently joined a, um, a, a bus an airport bus, which uh, the uh, <coughs> surveillance teams had under surveillance, and which, of course, this time uh, sent alarm bells ringing. Although we had the uh, the airports covered, and that uh, we were still concerned that uh, he may somehow slip the net. So we followed him. It was quite an interesting morning. We uh, two or three police cars with uh, detectives on board. We headed out. Um, and it was peak hour traffic on a Saturday morning in the middle of Melbourne, so there was traffic everywhere. I'll never forget that morning because one of the easiest routes for us to follow was to follow the tram tracks up the middle of Melbourne, which we did, uh, missing a few trams here and there on the way. But we finally followed the airport bus out to Tullamarine Airport. And just as uh, Lou arrived in the bus at Tullamarine, so did we arrive and we uh, alighted from the police cars, we surrounded the airport bus. There was other passengers on board, so we had to be very, very careful and professional that uh, we didn't end up into some type of uh, siege situation where we had a, a suspect for murder trying to arrest someone in a public place. It's always a problem when you're doing that. This was about one o'clock on a Saturday at Tullamarine Airport, so there were, there were people everywhere. And uh, so we had to be very careful. And so it was all done quietly and professionally, but we surrounded the bus. And uh, we allowed for the passengers to get out and we watched all the passengers get out the front door. Um, the driver got out and allowed people to get their, their bags out of the bus. And then we saw Lou. 
he was about midway in the passengers alighting from the, from the bus and he walked down to the back of the bus to pick up his bag and that's where he was grabbed. And there was an absolute look of surprise on his face. Uh, the fact that uh, it was so close for him, another uh, 20 or 30 metres and he would have been inside Tullamarine Airport and he may have been past the state line, gone into the federal area and uh, been on board a plane. Lou is interviewed at the investigation complex in St Kilda. Lou uh, made no admissions uh, to the offence, uh, which was something we always thought may occur was he stated that he'd lost his wallet shortly after his arrival in, uh, in uh, Australia back in January of that year. We took him through each item that was contained in the wallet and um, he agreed that um, these items were, he, were his and uh, included in the wallet was a, um, a lottery ticket or a lotto ticket uh, which had been purchased in Melbourne. Uh, in June of that year, how he had originally said that he'd lost his wallet back in February that year. Uh, now, when, when shown the, uh, the lotto ticket, he uh, agreed that it was his lotto ticket and they were his numbers on the lotto ticket, so uh, he didn't pick up at that stage what he'd actually said, but it became a significant part of our brief so far as... Uh, uh, blowing out his uh, story of the wallet having been stolen, so we knew we were on the right track. Chu Sang Lu is charged with the murder of Dr Victor Chang, but the second suspect, not yet identified by name, will be much harder to track down. In fact, he's already slipped out of Australia. Malaysian criminal Chu Seng Lu has been arrested for the murder of Dr Victor Chang. Now he has to be discreetly and safely returned to Sydney to face charges, but public and media interest is so intense that the trip has to be carefully planned. On the Thursday morning at about 3am 3, 3 in the morning, our team went to the city watch house and uh, we took possession of Lu. He was placed in our cars and we drove him uh, from Melbourne back to Sydney. It took about uh, 10 to 12 hours, but it was a very secure, it was a safe trip. And um, as far as I'm aware, uh, to this day, the media were not aware of us leaving Melbourne at that particular time. And I remember that about halfway, I can't remember exactly where, but about halfway up between Melbourne and Albury, we had to stop for a comfort break and it was pitch black. And he indicated that he, you know, he needed a comfort break. So we stopped and we let him out of the car. And, and I suspect that he was very, very apprehensive about getting out of that car. And I don't know what was going through his mind. One can only presume what might have been going through his mind, but he was obviously very, very apprehensive. We arrived back at uh, Sydney Police Centre um, I think from memory it was round about one o'clock in the afternoon, one or two o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, he was charged then with murder at the Sydney Police Centre and uh, was placed in the cells there where he stayed for a couple of days. Lou is remanded to appear for committal proceedings. Meanwhile, the second suspect, the unidentified man seen in meetings with Lou, has flown out of Australia, presumably to Malaysia. Well, he got out of the country uh, because we hadn't been in a position to identify him at that particular point in time. So he left Australia uh, uh, as, so, as a free agent. On July the 15th, the fugitive is identified as Philip Lim, a 32-year-old Malaysian. Lim has permanent Australian residency and has been working in a Melbourne restaurant. A warrant is issued for his arrest. Following the arrest of uh, Chen Seng Lu, uh, the identity of the second person was established. However, we had missed him by approximately 24 hours before we actually did have his name. And uh, he had arrived in Malaysia 
We immediately contacted the Royal Malaysia Police and attempts were set in place from that moment to try and locate and apprehend Lynn. Superintendent Takbir Nazir Mud of the Royal Malaysian Police Force is already aware of the case. Well, uh, as far as the, that case is concerned, I first read about the incident in the newspaper and then uh, as soon as uh, that happened, we had some uh, communication or some requests made by the New South Wales Police to the Royal Malaysian Police for assistance to try to locate a personality uh, whom they believe have absconded from Australia and may have uh, returned to Malaysia. He, will, he is said to be a Malaysian. Task Force Oak detectives are dispatched to Kuala Lumpur to join local police in tracking Lim down. Upon our arrival in uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, we had a meeting uh, with the Commissioner of uh, the Royal Malaysia Police where the resources of the entire police force were uh, placed at our disposal. And um, all I can say is that that was the credence and the importance that the police in Malaysia and the Malaysian government placed on this investigation. I think it would be our duty to try, as a policeman, to try to apprehend and uh, indicate or to show to, the, to, to Australia that we will give whatever necessary cooperation needed in uh, trying to combat any form of crime or the in, any international crime that may, ha may happen, be it a Malaysian or Australian, it doesn't matter. A crime is a crime. It can happen anywhere and we'll be there to basically cooperate with any country for that matter to try to apprehend them. Malaysians share the outrage that Australians feel over the needless death of a great man. In fact, many take it personally. Because it was Dr Chang, uh, Dr Chang being such a prominent surgeon and very well known, but I think it also had a lot to do with the offenders, or at that stage, the alleged offenders, being Malaysian and the shame that it brought uh, to Malaysia. Uh, that was something that came over very clear to us whilst we were working in Malaysia. You know, it reflects on the country slightly. In, in a small way, it will reflect uh, to the country of origin where the, uh, the criminal comes from. But it is so unfortunate that he, uh, he is a Malaysian. Detective Sergeant O'Toole and Detective Senior Constable Paul Jacob spend seven weeks in Malaysia, but they come home empty-handed. Uh, we returned to Australia quite reluctantly but we knew that the investigation was in very good hands. Uh, we knew how the police were uh, acting over there. Uh, they were very, very professional in what they did. And we were very, very confident that we would get a result. And we were very confident that that person was still in Malaysia. Meanwhile, the Melbourne team is on the trail of a third man and a series of raids is carried out at several addresses in and around Melbourne and a number of people were brought to the CIV and interviewed uh, uh, and amongst those was uh, Stanley Young uh, and uh, other parties and uh, from that we were able to uh, gather information which started to put together the picture so far as what had uh, taken place. A Toyota sedan is found that matches the description of the vehicle that collided with Dr Chang's car. It is owned by Stanley Nyung. This vehicle had damage to it, which was consistent to, the, uh, to having collided with the Dr Chang's vehicle, although it uh, had uh, personalised plates on it, uh, and it was subsequently established that uh, at the time of the, uh, the actual offence that there were uh, stolen plates on the vehicle, which were, as we understand, discarded at uh, Crow's Nest. But uh, we took possession of this vehicle, and checks were made uh, through various indices and there was a parking ticket located uh, in one of the premises down there along with uh, other items including a, uh, some 32 caliber cartridges. The parking ticket had been issued in Sydney shortly before the murder. Damage to the car dovetails exactly with the damage to Dr Chang's car. Police also discover that the second murder suspect, Philip Lim, drove the Toyota to Sydney and that he was booked for speeding on the way. This is crucial evidence. It places Lim, the car, and almost certainly the car's owner, Stanley Nung, in Sydney on or about the time of the murder.
it became uh, apparent that Ng had been with uh, the other two at some stage, uh, although not at the time of the uh, of the actual offence, but uh, had been uh, uh, present with them when they were uh, preparing to carry out this robbery. And in fact, he was interviewed subsequently, interviewed and. Uh, and made admissions to that effect. Stanley Nung is given immunity from prosecution after he agrees to become a witness for the Crown. His inside knowledge of the conspiracy that led to Dr Chang's death will prove to be critical. As it turned out, it proved to be uh, pretty close to the truth. And it simply was that these people had come to Australia uh, with the specific purpose of making some money by holding somebody to ransom, a prominent person to ransom, making some money and returning to Malaysia. It was really a get-rich-quick scheme and they didn't think of the consequences that it would have for all these people. In November, four months after Dr Chang's murder, the final piece of the puzzle falls into place. Philip Lim, the man suspected of murdering Dr Chang, along with Chu Sang Lu, is finally tracked down and arrested in Malaysia. The arrest was made uh, by the Malaysian police after lengthy and protracted uh, surveillance operations. A number of his associates the, uh, had been placed under surveillance and a number of premises where he was known to frequent were also placed under surveillance by the Malaysia police. Police have identified credit card transactions made by Lim at this shopping mall, proving that he is still in Malaysia. But it is surveillance of Lim's girlfriend, Kitty Yao Kit Lei, an exotic dancer, that finally leads police to the suspect. You know, we were basically going all out for her because it was a bit impossible to locate uh, the suspect without going through her because we have tried raiding s several places here and uh, he, he was nowhere to be seen. And we knew he was somewhere in KL, he was moving north and south of Kuala Lumpur, but uh, she was the, the, the most important contact point for us to basically do surveillance on. Upon learning that Lim is travelling to Kuala Lumpur by bus and that Kitty is to meet him there, police rush to the bus terminal. We have about five takeout teams there. We had the whole area covered. There was no way for him to get out of the area. We have got a surveillance team all there. And then the assault team is already there in case of any uh, form of, uh, you know, in case he comes up with any weapon. We are not sure at that point of time. But uh, basically, we surprised him and there was no way that he could have escaped. Superintendent Tuck Beer calls Dennis O'Toole in Sydney to tell him that Lim has been apprehended. I made a personal call to Dennis that night, he said about three, I get about three, four in the morning to just relate to him the good news about the arrest. And it was, very, in fact, Evelyn, the wife, answered the phone. I was surprised that, you know, she was quite uh, relaxed at that point of time, at that hour to be, uh, you know, to, be, to, to, to receive the call. And then he was quite elated about the arrest. And then we were hoping that they could come and they came quite uh, fast over to Kuala Lumpur. Back in Kuala Lumpur and armed with an extradition warrant and a brief of evidence, Dennis O'Toole tours the bus terminal where Lim has been captured. Yes, this was the culmination of a seven-week police operation when Lim's girlfriend, who had been under surveillance by the police surveillance unit, came to the telephone, reached the telephone here, and as she reached for the phone, the five police surveillance units bounced and arrested both Lim and his girlfriend at this location. For Philip Lim, being arrested in Kuala Lumpur means being locked up in a hellish place, hundreds of years old and in an advanced state of decay. It is the same place that Australians Kevin Barlow and David Chambers were hanged after being found guilty of drug smuggling in 1986. It has been a massive joint effort by the men of Task Force Oak and the Royal Malaysian Police. Now that Lim is in custody, there is relief all round. The operation conducted throughout Malaysia by the Royal Malaysia Police was a, was a very large scale operation, an enormous operation. Uh, a lot of effort, a lot of resources went into it. And uh, at the end of the day, it was just an enormous relief for everybody concerned that it had been successful and the person responsible had been apprehended.
Philip Lim is brought back to Australia to stand trial, along with Chu Sang Lu. But before the trials begin, the gunman Lu will spring another surprise. Chu Sang Lu and Philip Lim are to stand trial for the murder of Dr. Victor Chang. Police apply to have them tried jointly. Dennis O'Toole prepares the police case against Lim, while Ron Smith prepares the case against Lou. But Lou springs a surprise. After initially indicating he will plead not guilty, he changes his mind. But as for actually admitting that he was the man who shot Dr. Chang, he is less forthcoming. And even then, he never made a, f a formal uh, interview saying, yes, I... I actually shoot him, but it was from his plea of guilty and the evidence that we had at hand, the evidence of Lim and the descriptions of the parties seen at the scene sort of thing that uh, were fairly convinced that he uh, was the offender. Philip Lim stands trial. Mark Tedeschi, QC, is the Crown Prosecutor. As he outlines his case, an extraordinary, tragic and at times bizarre story unfolds of an amateurish extortion scheme that has spiralled out of control. Lou, Lim and Stanley Nung drove from Melbourne to carry out a sinister and improbable plan to kidnap Victor Chang and hold him to ransom. Lou and Lim had connections with triad gangs in Malaysia and had rung up large gambling debts. They were hoping to pay off those debts with money extorted from Dr Chang. The three men holed up in the inner suburb of Surrey Hills for nine days before moving to Campsie, 12 kilometres further west. They then moved to nearby Summer Hill. All the while, they were closely observing Dr Chang's movements and planning their crime. Amazingly, the conspirators made two previous attempts to carry out their extortion plot. Eight days before the murder, they went to Dr Chang's home, but it appeared he had visitors, so they fled. The following day, they tried again. Some days prior to the murder of Dr Chang, the two offenders that were responsible for his death and a third person had gone to Dr Chang's house. They'd set off the house and they'd actually followed him from his house as he travelled into St Vincent's Hospital. However, they didn't carry out the kidnap attempt, as that, that's exactly what it was at that time, as the driver of the vehicle became very nervous and there was a second person in the vehicle. Uh, so the driver himself decided to pull out of that attempt and as a result of his actions, he was left out of the enterprise, as it were. And the other two decided that they would continue without him. After a heated argument, Stanley Nung flew back to Melbourne. But Lou and Lim decided to go ahead with their scheme, unable to grasp the fact that their chances of success were virtually zero. When the people responsible for this outrage, as it were, were interviewed, we were quite amazed to think that they were actually confident that they could carry out such an operation. And the operation basically was that they intended to stop Dr Chang on his way to work by creating a road accident, getting him off the road, giving themselves the opportunity to talk to him, putting to him that they were going to kidnap him, that they wanted the sum of $10 million that was the figure that was agreed upon by these people. And if he didn't agree to do that, that they would go back to the house where they would proceed to hang his children one by one. So the whole sc scheme itself, you could never in a million years say that it was very professional. Uh, it was quite an amateurish botched job, uh, which ended in a terrible tragedy. And so, with an air of grim inevitability, the third and ultimately fatal attempt to kidnap Dr Chang began on the morning of July the 4th, 1991. The staged accident, the threats and the demands for money 
and the terrible irony that Dr. Chang was on a life-saving mission at the time. So there was actually someone waiting at St Vincent's Hospital uh, for Dr. Chang where an operation would be performed and he never got there because two fellows decided to extort money from him and then kill him and he never got there. And we think that what's happened at the, the crime scene is that Dr. Chang has resisted their attempts at this extortion to get money out of him and there was some indication that they, they wanted to take him to his home and he knew that his wife and his daughters were at home on that particular morning. And there's no way in the world that Dr. Chang was going to allow these two offenders to go to his home. Dr. Chang knew that his wife and children may be in jeopardy if the criminals were to get into his home. He courageously stood his ground. And he's fought them. To some extent, he stood his ground. And the fact that he stood his ground was that these two killers um, obviously became perturbed that they weren't getting their way. Uh, they weren't achieving what they wanted, which was extortion. They wanted money. It was murder for money. And so they simply, one of the offenders, which was Lou, subsequently pulled out a 32 pistol, placed it at Dr. Cheng's uh, head on his cheek and pulled the trigger and shot him in the head. He fell to the ground and then our eyewitnesses tell us that uh, Lou then bent over Dr. Chang's body, placed the pistol beside his head and pulled the trigger a second time. And he was shot twice and he died instantly. An absolute tragedy. The, uh, the first shot uh, that was fired by Chen Ching Lu uh, struck Dr. Chang in the cheek and the bullet travelled under the skin and exited just behind the right ear. Uh, did not fracture the skull, didn't damage his, his skull in any way. And uh, basically it caused him to be knocked out. There was no other uh, evidence that would suggest that he would have had any ill effects whatsoever from that shot. Unfortunately, uh, he fell to the roadway and whilst lying on the roadway, Lou fired a second shot uh, into Dr Chang and that was the fatal shot. Uh, the first shot, no damage. Uh, he would have literally come to and got up and walked away. And uh, that was the evidence uh, from the government pathologist. Philip Lim is found guilty of the murder of Dr Victor Chang and sentenced to 24 years. Chu Sang Lu has already pleaded guilty and avoided trial. His sentence, 26 years in prison. The brutal, senseless murder of Dr. Victor Chang is a tragedy beyond comprehension, but his memory lives on in the best possible way. On November the 23rd, 1993, the Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute is opened after more than $8 million is donated by the federal government, prominent business people and the general public. Long after the tragic events that ended his life fade from memory, the name of Dr. Victor Chang lives on. This quiet, charming man, the King of Hearts, is owed a huge debt and his memory will never be forgotten. For the men of Task Force Oak, it has been an outstanding investigation with justice duly done. But they are also left with a clear sense of what a tragedy it has been to lose a man like Victor Chang. This tragedy happened, we can't get around that. But the way that the actual investigation uh, was carried out, uh, I believe was, it was an outstanding investigation by all the people involved in that. And, uh, and I have nothing but the utmost respect for firstly the Victorian police and the Royal Malaysian police in the way that they 
place their resources at our disposal, the very professional manner in which they carried out all their duties. I mean, the, the, the community, for, for months and months, were all asking the question, why? Why murder Dr Chang? I mean, what a tremendous loss to the community. And, um, and I suppose the investigators went through this period, each of us, we couldn't come to grips with the why. I mean, in terms of the factual legality of the why, we had established that the motive was greed and it was extortion and it was a premeditated uh, and he was actually killed. But when we look back on it now, and I suppose even today, uh, looking back on it, we are still absolutely uh, amazed that this type of occurrence could have occurred, even today, in today's situation, when you look back on it now. It's even, it's still hard to come to grips with why was Dr Chang murdered. Philip Chun T Lim is released and deported to Malaysia in 2010 after spending 18 years in jail. Chu Sang Lu serves 21 years of his 26 year sentence and is paroled in 2012 and also deported. The parole decisions create a public outcry and are challenged by the New South Wales government but are ruled valid by the Supreme Court. The fact that he is now in Malaysia is just a straight perversion of justice in New South Wales. Victor Chang's family are devastated by the decision to release the killers and even more insulted when, after his release, Chu Sang Lu tries to apologise to them. Suffering from the advanced stages of Parkinson's disease, Chu Sang Lu begged for forgiveness. I'm very sorry. I hope you, you forgive me, your family. The name Victor Chang AC lives on in both his remarkable achievements in his lifetime and the grand legacy he has left the world. Chief amongst them is the outstanding work being done at Sydney's St Vincent Hospital and the Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute. The Institute is among the world's most respected heart research facilities, dedicated to finding cures for cardiovascular disease. Heart disease is the leading cause of death in Australia. More than 10,000 people die from heart failure every year, and it doesn't discriminate. It can affect anyone. Through heart surgery, Dr Victor Chang was able to save hundreds of lives but he knew that research could save thousands. His most famous patient, Fiona Coote, continues to pay tribute to Dr Chang's memory and help with raising much needed funds for the vital work of St Vincent's Hospital in New South Wales. Her familiar face fronted the national appeal by the hospital's fundraisers, the Curran Foundation, in 2018. Hi there, I'm Fiona Coote, and it's now been 34 years since Dr Victor Chang saved my life by performing the country's second successful heart transplant at St Vincent's Hospital. Back then, transplants weren't funded by the government, and so my transplant was only made possible thanks to a generous philanthropic donation by a former patient of St Vincent's. Following Dr Chang's pioneering path, the hospital's transplant unit has now performed well over 2,000 life-saving heart or lung transplants. Dr Victor Chang will always be remembered as a man who cherished life. In one of his last public interviews, Dr Chang gave a rare insight into the reasons he dedicated his life to the saving of others. And in doing so, perhaps tragically, he reflected on his own vulnerability. Life is not permanent for them, nor is it permanent for you and I. 